All right, everyone, the red light is on and we're recording. This is Mark back for another episode of The Veteran Semi-Professional. So this is the show for you if you're trying to figure out what do I do with my hands once I can put them back in my pockets, I can grow my beard and start putting on these things called civilian clothes. This is this is the show for you. Uh, my goal is to shed light on you know the options that are available for, available for you in your post-military life uh, and help you all make the, the best decision about you know, if you're weighing the decision whether or not to even get out of the military, or if you've made that decision already, trying to figure out, you know, what you and your family's life looks like uh, in this crazy life called the civilian world. Okay. So I am super, super stoked for today's guest. Um, Travis Rossback is just an awesome dude. Like you're involved in so many things, Travis. I can't wait to dig into all of them. It's super cool. Um, so I just pass it over to you and let you just do a, a quick intro and introduce yourself to everyone in the audience. Mark, I want to thank you so much. It's such an honor to come on to your show. I, I think that you're doing such good work and yeah, bless you for doing this. Cause I can imagine that this is not something that um, is easy for people. I mean, I have a contractor right now here. I am already going off topic. Um, I have a contractor literally here right now working with me who is um, out of the military and we have long conversations about how the transition period is and all of the things that he's going through and the depression and the just the change of life. And then now we got this whole thing going on with our current administration. And so there's some potential conflict afoot and and how he's thinking about that. But I'll get back on topic. But I just wanted to thank you for real. Like, I think it's awesome what you're doing and and helping people. I, I greatly appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, my name is Travis Rossback, and um, I started out in Salem, Oregon, and um, I basically I, I kind of, you know, in a nutshell, I inherited a, a fairly large book of business books, a, a bookshelf of business books when I was about twelve, and uh, started reading Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, a lot of the real professional business entrepreneurial, like how to and who's who books. And, uh, and then when I was 14, I met my, my dad, he was down in St. Croix in the U S Virgin islands. I flew down to meet him and he owned a couple scuba diving shops. And so I got to practice what I had been learning in these books. And, um, I became a dive master, scuba dive master and, and dive instructor right after high school. I, a few days after high school, I went right back home to the Virgin Islands, um, dive master, dive instructor. Then I got my captain's license, U.S. Merchant Marine um, captain's license, spent some time on uh, scuba diving boats, parasail boats, yachts, charter boats, all kinds of things. I, not fishing boats. I'm not a real big fishing um, aficionado. <laughs> um, but yeah, I spent a lot of time on a lot of boats. And then uh, one day it just kind of like struck me in the back of the head, you're a pilot. And so I kind of dropped everything and I just walked away from a really well-paying job. And I, I was I was in need of something next. And so I became a pilot, started flying for Seaborne Airlines, St. Croix, St. Thomas and Puerto Rico. Um, and then got kind of tired of that and moved up to Florida and became a uh, jet charter pilot, predominantly in Lears, Hawkers, Falcons, things like that. After a while, got tired of that and moved back home, started a fence company, got tired of that, sold it, moved out to Hawaii, started a sign and screen printing company, got tired of that, sold it, started Hydro Flask, which is a double wall vacuum insulated stainless steel water bottle, uh, grew that really, really quite large. Is it large or largely large? It was, it was fucking massive. Uh, got tired of it, sold it and started just kind of traveling the planet, looking at places I had never been before and, and trying to figure out like, who am I? What's next? If I'm not this hydro flask guy anymore, you know, like what's next and started the Tumalo group. Yeah, out here in Oregon to help people start businesses or take their business from whatever level they are now to the next level that they want to be. And nowadays I um, have a couple chainsaws. I, I have some property. I cut trees and, and throw rocks and, and help people grow businesses. 
Man, I feel like we could have 10 different podcasts about like each one of the different things you've done in your life. I mean, seriously, we could have like world traveler. We could have, you know, flying and, 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 and boat driving. We could have entrepreneurship. I mean, we could do like six different things here. Um, it, it's awesome. And it's kind of like why the reason, like when I, when I came across, you, I was like, I gotta get this guy on the show. He sounds just like super cool every which way to Sunday. Uh, and I, I'm sure you don't have any problem getting around from point A to point B if you know how to drive a boat and then also fly a plane. I like to hurdle myself through time and space <laughs> in large objects. I really do. Like I really, one of my goals is to drive a semi truck. I think that would be really cool to do next. Like a triple trailer, like let's go fucking big. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to do that. Like I, I'd love to go up to Canada right now and go join the convoy and just go. You know, because if if I drive fairly straight, I could probably do that. Yeah. Right, right. So I think I, what I'm what I'm thinking of like my first our, our first topic to get into. So you, you've talked multiple times about transitioning from from this to that, getting sick of X Y Z and wanting to move into something else. Um, and I think particular that's a, a particular value and interest to to this audience because you know we we have people listening who are thinking about. Maybe they're feeling the itch to leave the military, or maybe, you know, they've gotten out and they're in that first job and they're like, you know, this isn't quite what I, what, what, what I wanted. This isn't quite what I was envisioning. So I, I want to talk about that realization of, you know, this thing that I've worked on, Bill, maybe spent a couple of years doing and then saying, I'm ready to move on to something else. Can you kind of talk up through like what that process for you personally felt like and how you executed on it? Well, and, and I guess I need to probably preface all of this with, um, you know, like I'm still not married, but like I wasn't married. I had no kids. I was in my early twenties and my early thirties. And so I had a lot less baggage to take with me. I had a lot less responsibilities in life. Like I could kind of be a fuck up and nobody really, you know, like would call me out on it because I didn't really owe anybody anything. So it gave me a bit more of a freedom to go and just do and, and just take a risk and go. So I understand that now that I have a daughter and like now there there's responsibilities and, and things I need to accomplish. Like it's, it's a little bit different nowadays than when I was younger, but typically I, I, I don't like people fucking with me. I'm not a very good employee. I don't like to have anybody kind of holding any clout or, or anything over me thinking that they're better than me in any way. Not that I'm better than anybody else, but nobody, I don't feel like anybody's really better than me. And so like with the airlines, it, it kind of got to be monotonous. Like we were flying back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, the same three islands over and over and over again, just trying so hard not to fall asleep. Um, and after a while, after I, you know, kind of experienced that, it was like, okay, I've kind of had enough of this. Same thing with flying the jets. Like at first it was just awesome. I mean, it's so much fun to fly jets. And yet after a while, it just kind of became a glorified taxi driver and, um, a lot of responsibility, a lot of fun and a lot of learning was taking place, but, I always had a real longing for entrepreneurial endeavors. And I mean, even when I was on, I was on a yacht as a first mate for a while and I used to get in trouble all the time because I was reading business books. I was like, well, fuck you for telling me I can't read business books. Like he was telling me, the captain was telling me like, you need to read ocean books and captaining books. Like I already got my license. Why do I need to keep reading ocean books? Like Moby Dick, no thanks. I'm ready. You know, I want to read Zig Ziglar. So, yeah. So, for, so fun facts for you. When I was a kid, I think my mom had at least like one or two books of Zig Ziglar on tape. And I used to beg her to, to play them in the van uh, uh -huh. on the set when we were driving around. Like five-year-old me sitting in the back seat being like, mom, Zig Ziglar. For whatever reason, it just like, I just loved it. I don't know. It was his voice or something. I had probably no idea what he was talking about, but I just like, Loved it. And so whenever you hear people say Zig Ziglar, like that, I always, I just immediately go back to sitting in my mom's van on the way to the grocery store, like listening to Zig Ziglar. <laughs> That's so cool, Mark. That's an awesome story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sure a lot of that, like really set in too, even if it was just subconsciously, I'm sure even now today you're executing some of these Zig Ziglar-esque moves 
even unbeknownst to you consciously. <laughs> right, right. I'm sure like the, the the sweeping hand came in there somewhere and is moving me, you know, on the on the on the board in some way for sure. Yeah. Um, no, and it's it's funny you're, you're you're talking about you know having this kind of person who's who's over you and has that dominion over you. I, I just saw this meme the other day and it was like the idea of a boss is so ridiculous. Like there's this other adult who says you have to do this. And if you don't do this, then I'm going to punish you. And it's like, what, how was that? How, how is that like a normal dynamic in like, as a, as a human being? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I felt that in school even too. It was like the bell rings at two 45. I'm not staying after school for anything. You're not putting me in detention because at two 45 contractually, our time is up. Like I'm done here at two 45. And so I'd have to spend most of my detention in school school detention as opposed to after school detention because they knew that there was not a possibility that they're going to hold me in school after the bell rings because like by law my contract is up at 245 <laughs> and I guess that always kind of just like um, you know and I had a I had a stepdad who is Vietnam vet agent orange drugs alcohol it was rough I mean it was really really rough he did not want to be in Vietnam he did not want to get agent orange he did not want all of that to happen to him um, but unfortunately it did. And he kind of didn't know how to transition back into civilian life and drugs and alcohol were kind of his, um, how do you say crutch maybe to get him to, to sort of get through his days. And he took a lot of that anger out on me. And at the time it was extremely difficult. It was awful, but in hindsight, he kind of put in that. I, I won't even say kind of, he absolutely instilled in me that Marine Corps, you fucking do it until it's done. You only do it once you get it done. You don't have to do it twice. You don't do it all the way. You're going to have to do it twice, three, four, five times. I'd rake the backyard leaves. He'd come home drunk and high and whatever out of his mind at two o'clock in the morning. And if there was two leaves out back, he'd drag me out, throw me out back in the ice and snow and make me pick up those two leaves and start all over again. So I always learned like, it's better just to do it right the first time than to have to do it at two o'clock in the morning when it's snowing. So that was a little tangent there. <laughs> you know, I, something I personally have found myself doing a lot too, like that, that, that mentality of kind of do it right the first time is not even necessarily well, part of it, I think is like doing things 100%, but then also slowing down and doing things a little bit more deliberately. For example, last night I was, you know, recording a podcast and I was putting away my, my headphones and I kind of just like absentmindedly like wrapped the cord around the uh, headset real quick. And then it kind of went into this jumbled knot. And I was like, Mark, slow down, take an extra two seconds put this way nicely. And next time you need these, it'll be a little bit easier to use. And I, I, this is something like I personally have kind of found in, in my day-to-day -day life that I've been trying to do more, more deliberately. That's awesome. And, and then, like you said, and then the next time it'll be easier for you, Mark, to get your own headphones out and on. Right. And so you're going to say, so by taking just a little bit more time now, you're going to save time in the future. Also, you're preparing yourself for success. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go back to, you know, your kind of like, like uh, entrepreneurial journey here. So you, you, you've done a couple of things. You had a couple of projects, started a few businesses. Um, you know, you mentioned Hydro Flask, which is, you know, definitely probably, I mean, I think it's probably your, your biggest brand with probably most people kind of, you know, vector you in. I, I, you know, I have a Hydro Flask sitting in my corner right now. Like plenty of people have Hydro Flask. They're, they're, they're a big thing. Um, where did the idea, I'm a sucker for, for a Genesis story. So where, where did the idea come from? And then we'll kind of get into like how it started and, and grew. Yeah. So the idea was I, I, I had a um, sign company, a Wahoo signs and screen printing. I had a partner at the time, one of my ex-girlfriends and um like it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of a combination of a few things that kind of were that came together all within this, you know, this time realm. One of them was I got a, a um, like a magazine for screen printing supplies in the mail. And they showed a picture of this little aluminum water bottle with this little screen printer. And you could like hand screen print a, a water bottle. I was like, well, that's interesting. And for some reason, like I kind of geeked out on it. I was like, well, that's kind of cool. 
I told my brother about it and he's like, no, I'm not going to start a water bottle company. That's stupid. I was like, okay, forget it. You know, like I got the sign company. I'm doing okay. I don't need anything more on my plate right now anyway. And then about, I don't know, time units later, a week, a month, whatever it was later, I was downtown Honolulu running some errands. And when I was a pilot in flight training, I worked as when I was in college, I guess I could say, um, I did a lot of rock climbing and I worked at a rock climbing supply, uh, well, rock climbing store, Red Point Climber Supply. And so I knew Nalgene water bottles, these plastic water bottles is what we need. Like I, I was watching the plastic wash up on the beach of our, in front of our house every single day. And I scuba diving would see plastic everywhere, single use water bottles, slippers, uh, or uh, flip flops, toothbrushes, combs, all this shit, just plastic everywhere. And so I went in to go get a plastic water bottle because that's just what we had then. And the entire wall was completely empty. There were only two water bottles left, a pink one and a green one. And I asked the, the sales rep, I was like, what happened here? And he said, well, we're not really sure what it is, but there's this stuff, the owner's French. She saw this article when she was in Europe last time about this, this chemical that's maybe not good in plastic. So as a preliminary or as a precautionary, um, shit, I always remember the net. I always forget the next word as a precautionary measure. We pulled all of the plastic water bottles off the shelf. And so I was like, well, who's going to fill up the shelf? Who's going to fill up this wall? And he said, nobody, there's nobody else to do that. There are no other brands. And it, it just came out of my mouth. I will, I will do that. And, and I, I said it and he laughed at me. And in that time span, I saw 10 years or so down the road of myself speaking on stage about a successful water bottle brand. And it freaked me out. I was like, holy hell, what just happened? And I just kind of looked at him and I just kind of was like, okay, dude, like you don't know, but I've already done it. Like it's our, it already is. And so that's kind of how it started. And then, you know, it went from there. I love that. I love that. I, I think there's such a great lesson in someone saying, I don't know what to do here. I don't have a solution. I don't have an answer. And then you as an entrepreneur, just kind of stepping in and saying, I, I've got it. I've got your answer. Even if you don't have jack shit in the background, you don't have a single water bottle. There's no, you don't have like a manufacturer or nothing. You're like, I see problem. I know solution. I'm just going to figure it the fuck out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, that's exactly what it was. I had like, even when I said it, I left like kind of shaking my head going, fuck Travis. Like, why do you say shit like that? I, I don't typically say shit like that. I don't lie. Like, I don't know why that came out. Um, I went back to the sign company and I had, I always like to employ people who are younger than me so that I can know kind of like what's hip and cool and trending. And so I asked one of them, I said, Hey, what do I do? And she said, Oh, you got to get this aluminum water bottle come, you know, bottle. It's the best. It's the best in the world. It's just awesome. So I did, I bought one. It was stupid. The mouth was too small to put ice in. I couldn't put it in the freezer. It dented easily. I looked inside. They had this gold liner that flaked off and I called him and I asked him, I said, what's this gold liner stuff? And they were super rude and just not very friendly at all to me. Like, get out of here, kid, you're bugging me. And I was like, yeah, this has got to happen. So I called my brother and asked him, he just started working at REI here in Bend. They just opened. And um, he says, Hey, there's this metal water bottle company. You got to get it. It's the best in the world. It's just awesome. So, okay. There's two different brands. One, I don't like, well, one, there's three, one got pulled one. I don't like. And the third one, I tried it. It was single wall. I took it out to the beach to go surf. I'd come back in. It was too hot to drink. It burned my tongue. It like it dribbled all over my shirt. Like it was just stupid. And it was like, okay, this is, this is legit. Like this is a need. I need a better water bottle. I can imagine other people might want one also, but I want a better water bottle. That's, that's awesome. Okay. So I think that for in starting a new business, there can be particular challenges when it's a physical product, right? So if it's a, 
if you're doing something online, you can find, you know, no code apps and you can kind of sit in your room and look at a computer and kind of start hacking away and, and, and make something happen fairly easily, right? But making physical things is, is a different process. So how did that look in like finding, connecting with the manufacturer, finding someone to like design the bottle you wanted? Um, talk to me through like the, the product development piece of like how you kind of made something you were proud of. Yeah, so at the sign company, we had a client who would sort of take these field trips over to the Canton Fair in China. And at the time it was called Canton. Now I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's a different name because it's no longer Canton. But basically the way he described it was just this massive, massive area that all of the who's who of factories would come together and basically sell themselves to the world. They'd say, look at our factory, we're better than everybody else. And so you could get electronics and there would be miles of electronic factories and you could get hard goods made and there'd just be miles of metals and plastics and woodworking factories. And I asked, and he, he would take American um, entrepreneurs over and kind of you know, help you know, the whole process. And I asked him, I'm like, hey, could I come with you? I got this idea for a water bottle. He's like, yeah, no, there's no, there's no need for you to come with me. Nobody makes these water bottles. It's just not a thing. It's like, oh, damn. Well, <laughs> I really want to make this water bottle. And he's like, yeah, sorry, kid. Um, so I, I found a plane ticket to Shanghai. It was like the cheapest plane ticket I could get was into Shanghai. And I happened to find a, a factory that made, they said they made water bottles. So, you know, why not? And I just took off to Shanghai and this is about 2007, 2008. And, uh, I got there and they're like, no, no, we do plastic water bottles. Yeah. Well, I want to do double wall vacuum insulated stainless steel bottles. And they're like, you need to leave, <laughs> you know, like that's not even, you're in the wrong area, dude. Um, but my grandpa had, and I actually, I still have it. My grandpa had this old ass thermos that was super heavy. There was glass inside. It stinks. It's not easy to use. It's just super heavy. And my thought was like, well, well what if we take that glass out and put stainless steel inside instead of the glass? Like if we do a high quality stainless, we don't need the glass, which is so heavy. And um, so I'm in Shanghai and I was like, like literally like, oh shoot, I only had one contact <laughs> and it didn't work. Like, what do I do for the rest of the time that I'm in China? Like I'm screwed. And just as I was leaving, this guy came up and kind of grabbed my arm. He's like, it, well, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because it was, you know, not exactly right. But he says, he's like, Hey man, I got a cousin who helps people find factories and um, you should go talk to him. I was like, okay, how do I, you know, what does that mean? How do I do that? So he draws out like, what to show the taxi driver and what to show the train station. So I have these two pieces of paper. I show the taxi driver, I get to the train station, I show the train station, I pay in the money and I'm off to this unknown location down South four hours away. And I show up in Hanzhou and there's like, you know, 20 billion people at the train station. And I, and I realized like, Oh man, I, I probably should have done some better planning than this. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And luckily I was the only white person out of 50 quadrillion people there. And um, this woman walked up and she's like, Hey, I'm Natalie. Are you Travis? I said, yeah. And she's like, all right, let's go find you a bottle. Factory. <laughs> so I'm like, Oh, thank God. Three days we spent looking at um, bottle factories in the Yin Kong Jinhua area of China. And they were like single wall stainless steel, but they had no, means of doing vacuum there just weren't that many vacuums in the country at that point so we were like the first day we went to like three or four and they all said no the second day we went to one or two and they said no and then finally the very last one of the second day with them they're like well that kind of sounds stupid but um okay and they took a shot on it us and um and that's you know kind of how we we found the factory that's that's great. Uh, I, I love that. There, there's there's something about just like throwing yourself into the mix and just seeing what happens and like seeing who connects with you and everything. It's just sometimes someone was telling us this analogy in one of my classes the other day of 
they call it the, the, the hallway, okay? And every door leads to a hallway. But you don't know the other doors that are in the hallway until you just open the first door. But it takes you opening that first door to then see what's in the hallway, right? And so, like, for you, the hall, like, the first door was, you know, get on a plane to go to China. And then that leads you to looking at all these other manufacturers. And then, like, some guy hears there's this crazy American running around trying to make these uh, stainless steel bottles. Like, who the hell does that? And he's like, well, my cousin might be able to help him out. So then, like, that opens another door. And it's just sometimes, like, you, you got to just throw yourself into the hallway to find out, like, what opportunities are out there. That's a great analogy. That's a great analogy, Mark. I totally like that. It is. It's true. Like, and I'm, I'm very inquisitive. Like, I don't mind pulling over to ask for directions, you know, before GPS, right? Because I don't want to waste my time, energy, and fuel driving around like some jackass, like I know what I'm doing. I don't know how to get there. I'm going to ask the guy at the gas station because he probably knows how to get there. I don't want to waste my time and energy and effort. I'm going to ask people for help. And good people help. Bad people, eh, they might help, but it, you know, like it's good to get an average I found of about three people to give an answer and kind of average them out. I like that analogy a lot of the doorways. Yeah. Yeah. I always find like whenever you're, I'm always surprised and just like when you ask people for help, you're in, in like the human dynamic that's happening, you're going to them and kind of having, you're like exposing a little bit of vulnerability. You're like, I don't know, I don't personally know. And I, you look like someone who probably knows. So now you're being vulnerable yourself and then they are kind of getting a little bit of an ego stroke. Like, oh, I'm, I'm authoritative. This person thinks that I know something. I want to help them out because they're making me feel that way. There's a lot of times where we cannot be and are not the smartest person in the room. So if somebody comes up and says, hey man, you're the smartest person in the room. Can you help me with this? I think it is just kind of natural instinct to say, yeah, sure, I can help. You know, I, or at least I hope it's that way. <laughs> I, I'm curious too. So I, I'm, I'm judging based off of how well you pronounce all these provinces in China and everything that you, you've done a fair amount of traveling in China and probably done a, a good amount of business in China as well. Um, can you maybe talk about some of the, the, the cultural nuances in, in business dealings in China? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've been there a lot. I don't, I, I, I would need to check the logbooks to see exactly how many times I've been there over the last couple of decades, but I've been there a fair few times. I, I think like China is such, it's such a topic, especially now. Like I, I, I always feel like I have to, like, I have to be a little bit sensitive to what I say and what I share. Um, it's not like, it's not like what we see in the mainstream media in the least bit. I would say that the mainstream media probably tells us about 150 to 170 degrees off of what's actually going on and what it's like. Um, I, I, I remember like the, one of the first like, holy fuck <laughs> moments when I was in China was um, they, um, I, I, so uh, I go out, to, not with Natalie and Michael, but I, I ended up meeting this other couple who said they kind of did the same thing and they could help me find a, a factory and I won't say their names, but um, this guy and, and this, and this girl, and they were kind of partners in business and in kind of partners in life. I wasn't really sure how that worked, but um, one time we were like out at dinner and we went to the fanciest, nicest restaurant at the time. Like it was the, like, they, they were so excited to go to this restaurant because they didn't have the money typically to go there until like Travis shows up. Now they have to impress me. And I walk in and it was like live turtles and live fish and live eels. And there's like, it smelled like, like just like seafood and animals. And there were, you know, chickens squawking and feathers flying. And like, this is the nicest factory or nicest uh, restaurant. So we get this very VIP, special, special, nice room. Of course, everybody was smoking back then. Oh, yeah. So it was just full of smoke. And there was a bathroom in the restaurant room. Like we had a private room and there was a bathroom there. And the, and the girl goes in and starts taking a shit in the bathroom and leaves the door open. And I can see her and I'm sitting there eating my, you know, and I'm eating like, I, I, like I'm sick because of all the smoke and then I'm, right. I'm smelling and seeing all these like just exotic things. And 
And I'm sitting there going, oh my God, like, what am I doing here? I cannot believe that this is like what it's going to take to get this done. And then the waitress shows up and she's got chicken fingers, like actual chicken feet. Like yeah. there's like toenails on the chicken feet and, and they start sucking him. Oh, it just was, oh. And, and at that, I was like, I don't know that I can do this. Like, I'm not <laughs> sure that this is going to be okay, you know? But that was 2007. Like at that time, I'd walk out and on any street of any big city and there were black bicycles as far as you could see. Every single bicycle was black, looked exactly alike, all the same. And I used to think like, how in the hell do you know which bicycle is yours? Well, fast forward to about 2010, everybody's driving mopeds. No more bicycles. Everybody's got a gold, blue, or red moped, those three colors. Well, 2012, everybody's riding around in taxis. Nobody has any more mopeds because that's what the poor people have. We now have taxis. Well, 2000, whatever, uh, three, four years later, everybody has a Mercedes and a Porsche. And we go from these like meat market restaurants to like, now we're at the sky tower penthouse suite eating $5,000 meals. And just in you know, 10 years, they went from bicycles to Maserati and to watch that happen was just amazing. Like to, to be in Shanghai, watching the old Shanghai, like get demolished collapse. And then a glass skyscraper go up within like a year. And I was back so often that I could kind of watch this progression. And then like 5G solar, you know, streetlights and Maserati, Bentley, um, like nobody really does Mercedes anymore, you know, and it's just Lamborghini, Maybach. So it's, it's been a radical, radical shift of culture in, in China and good on them. Um, but at the same time, like, like I have a lot of family members who, you know, <laughs> are not driving Mercedes, you know? Right. And so right. it's, it's always kind of one of these like dichotomies of my life where it's like, fuck, well, that's cool though. And that's cool though. And that's cool. And that's good, but fuck, you know? And so it's been, my relationship with China has always been very tumultuous, I guess. But at the same time, I, I really like, I've got some great friends. They're almost like family at this point. And, and I really root for them, you know, I barrack for them and, um, yeah, but it is, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this all goes down with our current set of <laughs> shit we got going on with yeah. Taiwan, with mainland, with Hong Kong, with everything we got going on on the planet right now. It's going to be really interesting with our current administration versus our last administration and the differences, you know, working with China and the last administration and working with American manufacturers with the Tumalo group with the last administration versus the current administration versus what they say versus what is. And it's just, yeah, it's a, that's a whole topic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's really important. You know, you, you kind of mentioned at the, the, the start of this talk of there's a discrepancy, you know, there's like a, a 160, 170 degree difference between, you know, what the media says and reality. And I think it's just important to remember that like, there's, there's a narrative that gets, that gets told to us. And in reality, we, it's easy to overlook the fact that like they're people and like they're human beings and yeah. like we can still absolutely connect and our lives are not going to be like that dramatically different from one another. It's really easy just to, to assume that we're live, we're like two different creatures, but we're not. We're, still human. we're really not. We're human. And that's, and that's been the other big part of like traveling and, and, and spending time in a communist country um, has always been very um, educational. Like I always really get a kick out of spending time in communist countries because I see where our country's going <laughs> and it's like, fuck, you know, like what I'm seeing now is kind of what I'm seeing in some other countries. And I'm going, Jesus Christ, people, if you don't wake up, you're, we're on the same fucking track. And that's, it's, it's scary because it's, it's a, it's kind of a drowsy droopy, ah, 
ah, you know, it's just this. Ah, it's just two weeks. Ah, it's just one shot. Ah, it's just two. Ah, it's just this. It's just that. And then before you know it, it's like, we got to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's easy to forget like how, how fragile the system can be sometimes. And it doesn't take that much really to kind of make it, make it collapse. Like we, we, we do live in with that facade a little bit that like this thing is this thing that we call, you know, America and freedom and everything is just, well, it's just the way it is. And it's just, it's just given to us. And it's, you know, we just have to show up every day and it's just going to be there, but can very quickly erode and and, and go away. And yeah, I, I think that's, that's totally spot on. Well, and then that takes me to like, uh, you know, my contractor, for instance, and it's like, he doesn't want that to happen just as much as I don't want that to happen. He's way more prepared to help stand up and, and literally fight for our freedom than I am. But at the same time, fuck, I'm on his side and anything he needs, I'm there for him. Like we need, we need people who are going to stand up and say, nope, nope, uh-uh, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to go ahead and say, no, thanks. We're going to keep our American ways. Thank you. Um, I just hope to God it happens. Yeah. Not to be political or anything. Yeah. The the last thing I'll touch on in the, the conversation about, you know, business and culture in China, uh, I'm very much, I, I've very much heard that, you know, smoking cigarettes is like a, a kind of like must thing happen. Uh, and I'm used to remembering, you know, my time in Syria and, you know, the first time someone offered me a cigarette and I said, no, and they laughed at me and they're like, you stupid American. Like, what are you yeah. doing? <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, yeah. no, no one, no one tell my mom, but I did smoke a couple of cheap Syrian cigarettes over there just to ingratiate myself with some people. And it was just a nice friendly way over a cup of a uh, uh, scolding hot Turkish coffee, smoke a cheap cigarette and people start talking to you. Yep. 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 You know, and it's it, with China, like there was a lot of things, there were a lot of things that we used to do back in 2007 that we do not do in 2020, you know? And it's like, I won't go into it because I have a daughter now and she'll probably <laughs> someday, but there are a lot of things that we used to get away with or that it, not we would get away with. It was just their culture. Right. It, it's like, if you're going to do business with us and you're going to be one of us and you're going to be a lifelong friend and, and fellow comrade in business, Like, this is what we do to do business. And if you want to meet all of the, you know, suppliers and you want to get to know everybody, sure, we have the very sit down, very formal, nice to meet you. And, you know, you you, there was certain cultures and customs and, you know, how to look at the business card and, uh, you know, how to how to go from the business card to, you know, four o'clock in the morning, just completely pissed drunk and, and how to handle every phase in between. But it was all business. And I watched a lot of Americans uh, come over for other industries and other things. And they would say, no, thank you at the end of dinner. And they'd go back to their hotel room. Six months, a year later, they're not really in business anymore. They're not really it's not really going very well for them anymore because they did not partake in the true business culture that happens after the women go home type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Those personal relationships are just so, so important. I mean, we can talk about, you know, spreadsheets and manufacturing capability and everything all we want, but at the end of the day, someone wants to look across you from, you know, across the room and say, this is just the guy I want to do just like want to hang out with. And I guess we spend time with and like, I'm cool talking with him and all the other bullshit, like we can figure out in some way. It, it'll, it'll work out. Yeah. You're spot on, Mark. That's exactly what it is. It's like, you know, we'll figure out the numbers tomorrow, but do we want to actually spend time together tonight? And do we, and China's very, you know, they're very long term. We're very myopic in our views. Yeah. They're a hundred years down the road. I mean, they're looking at their great, great grandkids' future when they're sitting there smoking cigarettes with you tonight. And that was something that um, you know, spending time in the Virgin Islands and spending time in on, on the far side of the world really kind of helped me. Um, be comfortable with even just being in those situations. Like I've been shot at, I've been ethered, I've been in third world bar fights all over the place. So all of that prepared me to be in those nightclubs at three o'clock in the morning going, fuck, what am I doing here? Where am I? What's going on? Well, this is for the greater good of the business. And 
people don't talk about that. Like this isn't stuff that I read about in my, you know, Zig Ziglar did not talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. We, we, we'll have to have a, a, another show just about getting shot in E third and, and third world bar fights somewhere. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Um, I, I want to give you a chance to talk about Tumblr group. Um, so when, 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 again, like kind of like, when did the idea come about? You talk about like what you all do. Well, um, after I, after I exited my last company, the, the Hydro Flask one, um, I, I, I first knew that I needed to kind of take some time and kind of regroup and just, you know, figure out, you know, what the fuck, who am I, what's going on here? Where am I? What's, what's happening? Um, and I had a lot of friends and a lot of family and a lot of new acquaintances and a lot of strangers and a lot of fans and just people in general would reach out to me and say, Hey, do you mind if I, you know, pick your brain for 15 minutes or, Hey, can I, could you help me with this or that? Or could you, you know, can I fly you out and you take a look at this and tell me what's going on here? Cause I, you know, we're, we're at a stalemate with whatever. And so I started the Tumlo group to just help people do whatever it is they're doing business wise. Like I've been through a lot of ups and downs and sideways in business in general and so when people call me up and they're like, Travis, we go out to China and negotiate the molds from one factory to another factory. Fuck. Yeah, dude. Like I'm on my way. I'm out, you know, I'll leave tomorrow. Um, and then other companies, you know, the fortune, whatever companies they call me and they say, Travis, can you get us back in touch with, you know, with, with the common people? Like we lost touch and now we're losing shareholders and, and market value. And can you kind of help us? So I started the Tumblr group to kind of just help people from whatever stage they are to whatever stage they want to be as an advisor, lots of sourcing. I have a tremendous Rolodex, um, and, and for you, you guys that don't know Rolodex, it's like a contact list of, um, of really good friends and factories in Mexico and China and the United States. And so we help people take um, like a napkin sketch or back of an envelope drawing of an idea and help it get drawn up and help find a factory that can produce it. And we go through from zero to a hundred or from 50 to 150, like wherever you are to wherever you wanna be in business is what the Tumblr group basically does. Super cool. Super cool. And, and if people are hearing this and maybe thinking like, oh man, this might be someone I'm going to work with. How, how do you all work with, especially maybe like very early stage? Is it, uh, you know, is it like charged by the hour? Is it, you know, take a certain percentage? Like, I, I'm just kind of curious of what the compensation looks like for, especially something very early. Well, I like to be very flexible because I really do love this. I love creating products. Like I love bringing an idea to market. Like it's what I thrive on. I really, really enjoy it. So I try to be very flexible with how we charge. We do have some standardized kind of pricing and packages and things like that. Um, and I, I, the one thing I will say is that we do not fund companies. I am not an angel investor. I am not a series A startup investor. Um, but we do have people in our aforementioned Rolex that can help with that. Like we have people you can call and, and they can, you can talk to them about finding financing. I'd like to say that um, our, our sort of lane is financed or funded, like a funded startup company is that's looking to actually get going or, or like, you know, kind of imminently needs help with something. And I think it's that kind of like imminent facet that I really enjoy it um, because I, I enjoy, um, I was going to say, I enjoy the firefight and that sometimes that kind of feels how it is, but I enjoy that like under pressure feeling. Yeah. Of, like, we got to get the shit done right now. That's what, that's what I enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, um, it, it's, it's, I'm literally, I'm, I'm part of a team. We're building a, a tech product right now, focused focused on vets, and we're probably going to do like a soft launch here in about two weeks. So I'm recording this uh, into January right now, and like feeling that pressure and like it just it feels awesome. I love it. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. feels like you're 
live. Like you got some, you got a purpose, you got something to work for. You got something to do. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's not like, oh, I got to go mow the yard. I'll do that eventually. It's like, no, this shit's got to get done right now or else there's going to be some serious ramifications to my inaction. Yeah. 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 Well, Travis, we're, we're, we're coming down to the last 10 minutes here. Okay. Um, so in a minute, I want to pass back over you, just provide any kind of last thoughts, words of wisdom, if you will. Uh, but I have a question I always, I always ask my guests, okay? And so for, for the vets that come on the show, I always ask them what their, their favorite chow hall in the military was, okay? Uh, and then for my non-vets, I always ask them, I think this will be in, in particular a good question for you as such a, a wide range experienced traveler. What is your favorite and or least favorite airport to fly through? Uh. Wow. Um, I really like flying through Tokyo, uh, not, not, not Narara airport. The first, the Delta first class lounge has really good sushi. They've got really good beer on tap and it's like, who doesn't want to eat sushi in Japan? Like, so that's probably my favorite uh, food. Um, but one of my favorite first class lounges and, and I, and I don't mean to sound like a, fucking snob talking only about the lounges but that's after a certain amount of travel they just right. give you the right they just give right. you that um but i really enjoy um london o'hare and that delta lounge they've got a living or at least they used to i haven't been there since covid bullshit but um they have a living wall of um, like tropical plants and every once in a while you'll be sitting there and the water will turn on. And it's like, you're sitting in a rainforest. I always thought that was really cool. Um, I would say my least favorite airport was probably, um, well, I don't, I don't know that it was my least favorite, but I remember my, my most eye-opening airport was um, in Venezuela. And that was the first time I saw like, like, like big ass fucking rifles up in the torrents inside the airport. Like yeah. those men have guns and they're ready to shoot just in case. Um, however, I will say that another kind of memorable airport was Nairobi. And um, I very clearly remember leaving the Nairobi airport in the back of the taxi, or maybe I was, I think I was probably in the front of the taxi. I was in the front of the taxi. And there was a roundabout as soon as you come out of the Nairobi, uh, Kenya airport. And I had this really like horrible feeling. Like I had just this like really, really bad feeling coming over me. And I thought, fuck, is this the whole trip or what's going on here? And the taxi driver said, you know, like, dude, you all right? Like, yeah, yeah. I just had this weird feeling. He goes, oh, ha, ha yeah. Men just got killed here yesterday. I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, we, there was five or six guys that they had it at gunpoint uh, for like hour, like eight hours laying on the ground. They didn't know what to do with them. They got bored. So they just sprayed them. And he's like, they, they, you know, he's like, Oh, it's awful. I'm like, yeah, that sounds terrible. He's like, we had an hour and a half wait. We had to go out the other way. And it was just terrible. And he's talking like as a taxi driver, he's not talking right. about his life. And I was just like, yeah. Oh fuck. Welcome to Nairobi. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. it got better from there and I had a great time, but that was, that was a very memorable airport experience. Um, but I will, I also have to probably say that the flight crew uh, for Icelandic air <laughs> was very nice. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's good to know. That's good to know. Well, Travis, this has been an absolute pleasure having you on, man. This has been a, a ton of fun. I didn't even think we were going like, to have such a long conversation about business in China, but so glad we did. That was awesome. Um, yeah. Really come, really appreciate you coming on the show and just being able to share some, some awesome stories and some great insights for, for this audience. Uh, so I just want to pass it back over to you. Any, any last thoughts of this crowd who is you know, maybe still in the military, thinking about life afterwards, maybe they recently got out and they're maybe still trying to put some pieces of the puzzle together of um, any, anything you want to say to them? God, I, I, feel, I feel completely under knowledge. I mean, like, I don't know that I can give advice. I mean, it's such a, whew, that's a big thing like getting out of the military i i can't even imagine being in the military right now in this day and age january of 2022 um with with everything that's going on i like i i don't want 
same time. I would, can you hear me all right? Yeah, it sounded like maybe your, your mic unplugged or something. I don't know why it does. Oh, no, nope, you're back. You're back. You're good. Um, I would say that basically like, yeah, you know, it's, it's tough because I don't want to recommend getting out of the military because we need good military folks. And I can imagine that people who listen to your podcast are, are very intelligent and they're very on it and, and very good people. So I don't want to, you know, like I want to, I want to be protected. I got kids, like I got a daughter. Um, but at the same time, like there can be a very real good life outside of the military. And, and I just wish you well in, in whatever you choose to do. If you're thinking about that. Yeah. No, I know. I, I appreciate that. Like that's kind of very much the, the, the sentiment that I, that I try and bring across of, um, I, I want to show people options and give them tools to make the best decision. If, if that decision is to stay in, then God bless you do it. Um, I, lo I loved my time in the army. Um, I don't look badly on it at all, but for me personally, it was, it was the right decision to get out. And so, uh, I want people to know too, that there, there can be a way to find, you know, me and purpose and do something good in your life. Um, even with uniforms, you know, not, not on your back. So Travis, this is awesome, man. I, I can't wait to, to share this with the audience in the world. This is so great. Uh, so thank you for coming to the show. This has been awesome, man. Mark. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a lot of fun. It's really cool to talk to you and about things that I don't typically get to talk about. So I, I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy uh, the weekend. And I hope the, the chainsaw comes out and you get some good cutting in, okay? Yeah, me too. Cheers. <laughs> All right, man. Take care. All right, you too.